right. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to you fathers out there. Awesome. So, well, thank you. Hey, well, we're continuing our series called um, This Was Your I- Idea, and over the last few weeks, we've dealt with Are We Living in the Last Days? We looked at how do we uh, deal with singleness, and the last week, uh, we looked at how does God view homosexuality, and, and if you missed any of those weeks, you always can go to our website and watch uh, the message um, by, uh, by uh, YouTube. Well, today, we're going to deal with a, a subject I've been wanting to deal with for a long time. Do vegetarians eat animal crackers? <laughs> I want to find out if you guys are keeping up with me. Um, only kidding. We're going to look at how God, how do we do family God's way? And I tried to put together a message. Obviously, it's Father's Day, so I want to, you know, uh, have a message that's really kind of geared towards parenting and, and, and everything. But also craft a message that hopefully we can all benefit from. So the principles that I'm going to share with you today can really apply to, to all relationships. Uh, first, I just want to start off. Uh, have you noticed uh, how many of you guys have like three kids, at least three kids? Have you noticed as you have more kids, um, your outlook and technique changes? Anybody agree with that? You know, like when you have your first child, um, before you put them down and let them crawl on the floor, you made sure the floor was either mopped or vacuumed. You did not want to take the chance of them putting a crumb in their mouth. So you made sure the floor was spotless. Second child comes along, you didn't clean the floor, but you kept your eye on the kid. You put the kid down and they would crawl around. And if you saw them pick up a crumb and put it in their mouth, man, you, you, sw- you, know, you just swept in like Superman. You picked them up and immediately kind of fished out whatever they put in their mouth. Can you, anybody there? Okay. Third child, you don't feel like vacuuming the crumb from underneath your table. You're too tired. So you wake the child up from a dead sleep and you place them under the table to eat the crumbs underneath your table. Don't judge me. You know you've done that, okay? But how about moms and dads? You know, after you have that first child, you go on that first date, man. First time, you're, you're ready to go out and you get a babysitter and you call every five minutes to ch- check on a baby. Anybody been there? Oh, yeah. We've all been there. Second baby. Man, you walk out and you realize you didn't give the babysitter an emergency number, so you run back in, you give them your cell number. Hey, call me if anything goes wrong. Third child, you leave them with the instructions, hey, only call me if there's blood. All right, here's the last one, swallowing coins. The first child, they swallow a coin, you rush them to the hospital and you demand an x-ray. You wanna know where that coin's at in a child's system. Second child, you carefully, you don't take them to the doctor, you carefully watch to make sure the coin passes. The third child, you deduct it from their allowance. (laughs) So, hey, we all need to laugh, right? All right, let me give you five principles today that will help you most, and really in any relationship. And here's the first one is this, to have a commitment to walk close to God. In other words, you need to have an authentic and growing faith, and as if to say there's an inauthentic faith. And there is, and there's a large group of people who haven't really quite figured out that there's more to God than just attending a weekend service. That, that man, God wants us to, to, to learn to tap into his power, to his strength, and he has a, his abilities. And if you're here today and you're just kind of flirting with God, kind of checking out God. Man, there's a whole world waiting uh, to open up to you. And, and God wants to have a authentic, he wants to have a vibrant, he wants to have a very real relationship with every single one of us. And if there's a message that comes out of COTC, man, we want to lead you beyond just having a, uh, a weekend experience. But we want, uh, again, we want to lead you into experience where God knows you and you know God. You know, John 10 says his sheep know his voice. And God wants to be there for you. And, uh, you know, a, a few months ago, I had just a great experience after men's group one night. I had one of the men come up and just really poured his heart out uh, of a particular area that he was dealing with some pain. He had, had a painful situation that happened a couple years, years ago, and he was just stuck. He couldn't get over it. And it, it, was, it wasn't sin or anything like that, but he was stuck. And he poured his heart out uh, to me, and about three quarters into his conversation, he looked at me and said, you don't really have an answer for me, do you? I said, you're right, I don't. 
But the good news is we serve a God that does. And so, so we prayed together and we prayed that God would give him really wisdom and insight into the situation that he was facing. And, and you know, it was about an hour later. We left and about an hour later, I'm at home and I get this text from him and God had downloaded just really incredible wisdom and, and, and really instruction for him to overcome this pain in his life. And it was just dead on. And that's the type of relationship that God wants to have with every uh, one of us. The Bible says, draw close to God, and he will draw close to us. And, and if I have a message for you today, and that is to get close to Jesus. You know, the best parenting advice I can give you is to get close to Jesus. The best uh, marriage advice I can give you is to get close to Jesus. The best relationship advice I can give you is to get close to Jesus. Because as you get to close to, to Jesus, you begin to see things from a different perspective. All of a sudden, God gives you his heart. He gives you his insight. He begins to give you, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, again, just insight into the matter. I just want to show you a verse, Proverbs 14, 26. To me, this is a very powerful verse. It says this, reverence for the Lord, look what it does. It says, gives a man deep strength. So as we put God first, man, it gives us deep strength. And look what happened. Look who, who really um, benefits from us having a deep relationship with God. His children have a place of refuge and security. So step one is to, to, to commit to, to walking close to Jesus. Here's the second one is to be intentional with your time. You know, the best of families they know are very intentional with what they do and they don't do. And I know as a family, when we were a young family, we guarded our family time. We, we guarded va uh, uh, family vacation. Uh, I made sure that I didn't allow uh, church to, to interfere with my kids' events. And um, so I just want to challenge you, be very intentional with your time, uh, with your spouse, uh, with your children. And here's the other thing, be careful careful not to let iPads babysit your child. And hear me, I'm not against iPads. I have one myself. I'm not against kids having iPads. I'm just saying, be careful in not letting those things raise your kids or, or letting the media raise your kids or letting video games raise your kids. I'm not saying, you know, they, they can't have those things, but I'm, I'm challenging you to make sure that you have boundaries there. And don't let those things take your place or take the place of conversations that you really need to have with your kids. And by the way, um, you know you're too busy if you holler and, and tell the kids, hey, it's time to eat, and they automatically run to the car to get into the car to go to Chick-fil-A. Okay, just so you know, that's not a good sign, okay? Psalm 39, 6 says this, we are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. And the Bible says when our life is out of control and, and we're too busy, you know what? It, it's, it's just like busy, you know, it's like shadows. It's like two, uh, uh, you know, ships passing in, uh, in the night. And all that busyness leads to nothing. You know, I've been a pastor for many years. I've never heard anybody tell me, you know, as they look back over their life, I wish we had just done one more sport. I just wish we would have done one more sport. No, it's always going back to having more time with your husband, more time with your wife, more time with those that you care about and love. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says, it is better to have only a little with peace of mind than be busy all the time. And that's just plain good advice. Here's number three, help your child discover their purpose. You know, parents, you need to focus on what's that unique thing that really sets your child apart from other ones. And, and, and here's the deal, you don't, and your child doesn't have to be good at everything, but they're good at something. And you've got to identify what that is. And, and, you know, don't expect all your kids to get straight A's, man. I mean, you know, that's not an excuse not to have them to try harder and try to excel. But, you know, as I look back over, over, my, over my three sons, man, David was the one that he got straight A's. Man, he would come home with his report card. Hey, Dad, guess what, man? No B's again, all straight A's. And I look at him and say, man, I never had any B's either. Matter of fact, I never had any A's. <laughs> Matter of fact, you're trying to make me feel bad. You go to your room. I'm only kidding. 
But David had a heart for ministry. You know, I knew God had a call on his life. And so I made sure when we had special speakers come into the church and, and missionaries come in, that uh, when I would take them out for lunch or take them out for dinner, I made sure he was there. I wanted him to hear their stories of, of great stories of how God was using them and what God has called them to do. And parents, you know, your calling is to speak into your child's life. And I love what Paul says in Acts 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. And watch this. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Paul saying, man, my whole purpose in life is to, to, to identify that task that God has for me and to complete it. And that really needs to be a passion in our own life. And, a, and we, we need to take that as a responsibility as, as a parent to help guide our kids in that area. And that's what every great parent recognizes. And, you know, my job as a pastor is to help you to understand really the task that God has assigned you. That's why we do discovery workshop here at Church of the Cross and, and that's designed to help you understand your gift and at the end of that workshop you'll understand how you're wired and, and you'll be given like a, a, a list of ministries that you can use the gift that God has given you to fulfill, to fulfill his destiny for you. And it just makes my job easier when you understand your calling and you know what? It takes the pressure off you. Because you realize, you know what, I don't have to do everything, and I don't have to do everything well. This is what God has called me to do, and this is where I'm channeling my energies. And, and that is, that's just a game changer when you connect the dots there. Here's another side note, man. Be affirming with your words. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. You know, one of the regrets as I look back as a father is those moments that my tongue, you know, uh, you know, spoke before I really thought through uh, what I should say. Be careful with your words. You know, uh, Mark 10, 16, talking about Jesus, said, and he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. He spoke blessings over them. And fathers and mothers, I just want to encourage you, speak blessings over your children. Here's the fourth thing. Point them towards right relationship. As is to say there's wrong relationships. And guess what? There are wrong relationships. I've been, doing, I've been in full-time ministry for 31 years, the first nine years as youth pastor. And here's what I've come to know. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, and this applies to every single one of us, we are a sum total of our relationships. Good or bad, you are who you are because of the relationships in your life. And, and you can look at your, your, uh, your, ki your kids and who they hang with and understand the direction that they are going. Right relationships are critical. That's why we, we put such a huge emphasis on relationships here at Church of the Cross, whether it's small groups for adults or, or our, our student ministry or children's ministry here. I want to encourage you, if your child's not plugged into our student ministry or children's ministry, or encourage them in that area because it makes all the difference in the world. And parents, you need to model this yourself. You need to have right relationships in your, in your life. We all need cheerleaders in our life. We all need people that are praying for us, encouraging us, to, to really find our task and be a part of what God wants to do in us and through us. And your child is no different. And the best decision you will ever make in your life is your relationships. That's hands down. People always ask, well, well where am I supposed to, uh, you know, where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do? And you may want to write this down. Your what and your, and your, your, what and your where is not your most important question. Your most important question is who? Who are you supposed to do life with? Who are you supposed to allow influence your life? Who are you supposed to hang with? Because the, the uh, you know, um, it's the who, it's not the what and where. The what and where will follow. Actually, Proverbs 27, 19, another powerful passage that says this, a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. That's pretty strong. Proverbs 13, 20, 20 says this, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Maybe an updated version would be a companion of fool goes to jail. 
And this is where parents, you need to hold the line in this area with influence on your kids, man. And there may be pushback, but I want to tell you the benefits will be well worth it. Second Corinthians 6, 14 says this, do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteous and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? And here's the fifth one. Embrace amazing grace. You know why they call it amazing grace? Because it makes no sense. You know, we sing amazing grace, and, and he didn't just give us grace. He gave us amazing grace, man. He's not only forgiven us for the stuff we've done in the past, he continues to forgive us for what we do in the present, and he's committed to forgive us for what we do in the future. Who treats us like that? Only God. And hear this, relationships need amazing grace. There's not a single relationship, there's not a single person on earth that you won't have to have grace to stay in relationship with them. Why? Because relationships are tough, because they are imperfect, and we are broken people. So what do we need to do? First off, we need to recognize people are going to let us down. For those of us that are parents, man, we need to understand our, our kids are going to mess up. But we need to have the mindset that when they blow it, there is nothing that they can do that's going to change my love and my commitment towards them. That doesn't mean I'm not going to have a come to Jesus conversation with them with what they may have done. But they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, you know what, I'm not going to turn my back on them. It takes grace. And there may be somebody here today, you, maybe you're thinking about bailing out on a marriage or, or on your kids or on your parents, and you think, man, they're too unbearable, and you're thinking the grass is greener on the other side. The grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you plant it or where you water, I'm sorry. Every relationship takes grace. And you, get, you have to remember that, that we have an enemy of our soul that wants to destroy every relationship within our life. So we've got to be on our spiritual tiptoes. We need to understand, remind ourselves that, that Jesus says a house divided is not going to be able to stand, uh, uh, stand together. It takes the grace of God. And you may be saying, man, but you don't understand this person, man. I, you know, I can't forgive this person another time. This person has just, you know, used it all up. Well, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You may say, I can't do it. And, and here's time, man, there's time that people have hurt me deeply. But I, I tell you, when there's times that I feel like I'm tempted to hold back grace, to hold back forgiveness, I reflect back over my life because I recognize that I have hurt people deeply in my life. Even after becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, I have hurt people deeply. Who am I to hold back God's grace and forgiveness to other people? Because I know what God has done in my life. And I read a quote that stuck with me a couple weeks ago. And you might want to write this down. Forgive as quickly as you would like God to forgive you. Forgive as quickly as you would like God to forgive you. So again, every time you feel like, man, I can't forgive this person, you remind yourself. I think it's good to remember where we've come from. Uh, actually, Ecclesiastics 3.5 says this. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Everything makes sense until you get to, the, to verse 5. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. You may say, well, what in the world does that mean? It goes back to the Old Testament. It's referring to a principle and a truth that really we should have as a part of uh, all of our lives. And it comes from a story found in Genesis 31 where Jacob, the son of Abraham, has a relational issue with his father-in-law, Laban. And Laban wasn't a nice person to Jacob at all, and he was actually a, a, a pretty deceiving person. He had made him work for his daughter for 20 years and changed his wages. He never kept his promises. He was ruthless to Jacob. And, and again, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. And Jacob even agreed to take, a, take the, the weaker uh, 
animals and, uh, be, and give the, his father-in-law the strongest of the animals. And God actually blessed him for that, which made his father-in-law even um, more uh, mad at him. And so Jacob basically got to uh, uh, the end of his rope and said, I can't take this anymore. And so one night he gathers his family, uh, all his possessions and, and all his animals, and he takes off, he flees. And it takes Laban a couple days to figure out or even uh, understand that Jacob has left. And he is furious, and he's shaking, chasing uh, Jacob through the desert. He's wanting to confront him. And the night before he's going to confront Jacob, an angel of the Lord speaks to Laban, Laban and says, don't do what you have planned. And folks, maybe that's a word for somebody here today. Don't do what you have planned. Maybe there's somebody here that's planning on doing something that you know in your heart is wrong. And the an angel said, don't do what you have planned. You instead... Go and reconcile. So Jacob is, exp is, is bracing for a fight, and Laban shows up with these words, Genesis 31, 44. Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let us serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. There's this tradition in that culture, man. You, you had two opportunities with stones. You could either take the stone and throw them at somebody. They stoned people back then. Or you could pile up the stones and make an altar be between you and another person and God. And every stone that you would place on that pile represented an offense. So you take a stone and say, man, this stone represents. You remember that time that you stabbed me in the back? Clunk. Remember that time you said something about my mom? Clunk. You remember when you did this to me? Clunk. And every stone represented an offense. And so the scripture so, goes on and says, So they took stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. I love they sealed the promise. They, they sealed the covenant they were making between each other and between God with the meal. And they gathered stone instead of scattering stone. And hear me, here's the takeaway this morning. We all have a choice to scatter our offenses. Every single day, man, we, we have an opportunity to scatter offenses, man. People offend us. And, and, and we have a choice to spread it around and, and, and let everybody in on it through Facebook or whatever. Or we can take them to God and we can stack them up and, and make a covenant between God and receive e healing. And I'm encouraging this morning to give grace. Grace that every single one of us desperately need. I want to give you three quick steps to, to walk this out. First off, own your own mistakes. It's so easy when, when conflicts happen, just simply point at the other person, maybe uh, what they've done. But look at your own life and ask yourself, what part did I play in it? And then humbly uh, take action on, on, your, re, on your, your end of it. You know, I love what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 3 and 5. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Man, to me, J Jesus has a sense of humor here. He said, man, hey, dude, take the two by four out of your own eye before you try to remove the sawdust speck in your, in your uh, brother's eye. And, you know, we... we um, we need to do that, man. So often we're just so consumed with what the other person has done. Let's look at, let's own our own stuff. Here's the second thing. Abandon the right to get even. We live in a generation that loves to scatter, man. We want to be right. And, and if we're, we, we're right, we want everybody to know we're right. And, and if we're wrong, man, we need to make it right. We need to sue. Here's the simple truth. And this is radical. Christians don't take revenge Christians forgive. I want to say that again. Christians don't take revenge. Christians forgive. And I think we've gone away from that. And this is radical, but this is Jesus' way. 
I know we all know about the massacre that happened in Charleston this past week. And, you know, Friday I was shopping with my wife at uh, Sarasota Square Mall. And uh, she's in a, in a store, and I'm watching on my iPhone the bail hearings with, uh, for this Dylan Roof. And I don't know if you haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to show you a clip of it, of how the, the, the victim's family members have chosen to respond uh, to uh, the murders of their family member. I want you to watch this. I mean, what you guys just witnessed is Jesus to that young man. And I, I don't know if you know the story, but his motive for going into that African-American church and slaughtering those people was to start a race war. And how did they respond? They responded with the grace and love of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And there would, nobody would fault them if they would have walked in and said, I hope you burn in hell. I hope you rot in hell. Nobody would have faulted them. But they chose not to. And I'm in no way saying this guy should get a get-out-of-jail-free card. I'm not saying that. It's now in the hands of the courts, and the courts are going to walk out to justice. But what they did was they were Jesus to, to that person and really to the world because the world is witnessing that. I mean, that is going viral on, on YouTube and just seeing that type of forgiveness happen. And so what do we do? Romans 12, 19 says, Do not take revenge, my friend, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. God says, hey, listen, man, I'll take care of it. You just respond with the love and forgiveness to Christ, and I'll take care of it. And here's the last point, you know, just to be able to, to gather rather than to scatter is to apply God's grace in your relationships. Give grace. There's an opportunity. There's always an opportunity to scatter. And I want to challenge you to gather. And, and again, uh, hold lightly. You know, uh, make, a, you know, when, when somebody offends you, quickly deal with it. I want us to close our, let's close our eyes right now. I want us to close with prayer. I would just encourage you just to have the courage man, to identify those relationships in your life and just say, you know what? Enough's enough here. I'm tired of this relationship being this way. And today, I'm making a commitment to apply the grace of God to this relationship. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's another relationship. But, but you just say, God, I'm... Ex I am applying the same grace that you've extended to me. I'm extending to those around me. And Lord, we confess we will never have to forgive people more than you've already forgiven us. So today, God, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be a people that gather stones rather than to scatter them. Lord, that we be quick to build an altar and bring reconciliation. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bring healing into hearts of people here today that are hurting, that you would bring healing into relationships right now. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want to encourage you just to pray this simple prayer. God, today, God, I acknowledge that I need your grace. I need your love into my life. And I open up my heart to you right now. Forgive me for all the wrong things I've ever done. God, I, I, I acknowledge that I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And Father, from this day forward, I choose to follow you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.